Well, welcome to First Baptist Church tonight. I am glad that you are here for the few of us that are here in the dark tonight. It is completely different uh, with the time change that we had this weekend. We've been coming in and beautiful sunshine set out there tonight. It looks pitch black, but I'm glad for the few that are here that you're here. If you're tuning in with us online or over the radio, I'm glad that you're joining in with us as well. We're going to begin a new study tonight uh, from the book of Habakkuk. So we'll be starting that tonight, but before we do, we're going to go to the Lord in song and also go to Him in prayer. And then at the end, uh, we're going to spend some time here tonight just going through some prayer requests and spend some time in prayer together before we dismiss. Uh, real quickly, we are back meeting in person now for every service. We stopped last Wednesday night just for that night due to due to a uh, church family member that had COVID and wanting to make sure that we didn't speed up any kind of spread. And so thankfully it seems by God's grace that there's only one uh, of our, our sisters in Christ that has gotten sick. And she is uh, now at a family's uh, home, family member's home. So hopefully continuing to improve and we'll keep praying for her. Uh, but anyways, as far as Sundays go, Sunday school still in person, Sunday morning worship still in person, Sunday night small groups still meet, and then Wednesday, and Wednesday nights we are also uh, back here in person. So uh, I don't think we have too much to inform you on tonight other than we've got food pantry and clothing closet. It's coming up this Saturday from 10 to 12, and so we're looking forward to serving our community from 10 to 12 this Saturday. If you have a need, don't hesitate to come out, and we are happy to, uh, to help you in any way that we can. Uh, pantry, and, pantry and clothing closet will both be open. So... Also, got shoe boxes. Thank you. We are going to pack shoe boxes a week from tonight. So our goal is 250 shoe boxes to go with Operation Christmas Child there in Samaritan's Purse. We're going to pack those next Wednesday night, beginning at 6:30. And so uh, there won't be a service online next Wednesday night because we are going to be packing shoe boxes and getting all those ready to go. They have to be delivered the very next week, and we're going to want to. Pray over those on our Sunday morning service. So that's what we'll be doing next Saturday. We'll have gloves and masks for anyone and everyone who wants to come and pack. If you feel comfortable doing that, we'll meet in the fellowship hall for that. If you don't feel comfortable coming to pack, we definitely understand. And uh, invite you to just be praying uh, over those shoe boxes and the uh, children who will be receiving them. So I believe that's all the announcements that I have. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then... Carly and Katie are going to come up and lead us in song. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace knowing that it is still you who sits on that throne. Thankful, God. that no one and nothing can remove you from your throne. Thankful, God, that every moment you sit on your throne, you are ruling all things for your glory and you're working all things together for the good of your children, for the good of your people who have been called to have come to a relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So we pause tonight in the midst of all that's going on in our country, nation. We pause to see that our hearts are set on you. Father, we pray that you would be with our nation. Pray that you would be with those who are counting ballots. Those who are working in these states that have not yet been decided. Lord, that you would help the process to be done with integrity and honesty. Father, that you would See to it that we 
remain a nation who upholds the great right that we have in voting, electing our government leaders. Lord, I pray that Your will would be done. I pray that Your church would not waver. And I pray that tonight we would worship You, we would sing to You, we would study Your Word. from hearts, with hearts, that are grateful to You. That desire to worship You in a way that You are worthy of. A way that You deserve. With the reverence that You are due. Lord, may we not be Distracted, just settled in any way. But we, may we know that it is on Christ the solid rock that we stand. I ask these things in His name. Amen. If you will, stand with us and turn to page 511, and we will sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on His unchanging grace, and every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His covenant, His blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is on my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground You can be seated, and I do invite you to turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 1. As you turn to Habakkuk chapter 1, we find ourselves here uh, towards the end of the Old Testament. Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. We have a, a letter or a book from in our, our Old Testament. And 
Of course, one of the things you know about the minor prophets is that they were uh, used by God during times when His people's hearts were not uh, set on Him in many ways. He used the minor prophets normally as men who would bring His message to a people who had uh, decided to go about things in their own ways and for their own pleasure and out of their own desires and had done so at the cost of uh, turning their back on God, of forsaking Him and being disobedient to the old covenant that God had entered into with His people. And I say the old covenant because we understand that Jesus Christ has established a new covenant that we, as the people of God, as the children of God, as believers in Jesus Christ, are no longer under the old covenant because the old has passed away, the new has come, and in Jesus Christ, uh, the new covenant is supreme in every way. And so, as we think about Habakkuk and get ready to begin our study tonight, we do so after probably a day's worth and at least somewhat of a night's worth of keeping up with the news and following polls and studying numbers and listening to those who get paid to study election numbers and wondering about the direction of our country over the next four years, wondering who's going to be in the White House. We still don't have a solid answer there, and who knows how long it might be until we do have a solid answer on who's going to be sitting in the White House, and still wondering about what's going to come of the Senate, and just exactly how everything in the House is going to end up uh, settling out. And in the midst of that, it can be easy to find ourselves asking a question that we're going to see Habakkuk asking tonight. And that is, Lord, what are you doing? Habakkuk doesn't ask the question, Lord, where are you? Uh, Habakkuk doesn't ask the question, Lord, have you turned your back on us? Habakkuk asks the question, Lord, are you going to do nothing? Lord, I look around and I see all that is happening. I see that we as your people here in the land of Judah have forsaken you, that there only seems to be a righteous remnant left. I see violence, I see evil, I see wickedness, I see a complete um, acceptance of great immorality, and I don't see you doing anything to push, punish the wicked. I don't see you doing anything to fix all the evil that's taking place. And Lord, not only do I not see you, I, I'm not hearing that you're going to come in and answer. and uh, So that's the question that Habakkuk is going to pose tonight, and that's the question I've entitled our study, Will the Lord do nothing? Will the Lord do nothing? So read with me there, Habakkuk chapter 1. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. So we'll see the introduction to the book in verse 1. We're going to see Habakkuk's prayer to the Lord in verses 2 through 4, and then we're going to see God's answer. Habakkuk's prayer in verses 5 through 11. We're actually going to see uh, the same model played out uh, through the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 once we get to that in later weeks. But he, uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, God's word says, the pronouncement, or your translation might say the oracle, that the prophet Habakkuk saw. How long, Lord, must I call for help, and you do not listen? Or cry out to you about violence, and you do not save? Why do you force me to look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? ESV, there's probably a little better translation. Why do you sit idly by? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. Almost seems like that sentence could have been written today, doesn't it? Oppression and violence are right in front of me. Strife is ongoing and conflict escalates. This is why the law is ineffective and justice never emerges. For the wicked restrict the righteous, therefore justice comes out perverted. Verse 4 seems to 
explain a lot of what we see going on as well. Verse 5, look at the nations and observe. Be utterly astounded. For I am doing something in your days that you will not believe when you hear about it. Look, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter, impetuous nation that marches across the earth's open spaces to seize territories not its own. They are fierce and terrifying. Their views of justice and sovereignty stem from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and more fierce than wolves of the night. Their horsemen charge ahead. Their horsemen come from distant lands. They fly like eagles, swooping to devour. All of them come to do violence. Their faces are set in determination. They gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and rulers are a joke to them. They laugh at every fortress and build siege ramps to capture it. And then they sweep by like the wind and pass through. They are guilty. Their strength is their God. Notice in verse 1 that the Lord gives a message. So in response to the question, will the Lord do nothing? The first thing that we see is this book of Habakkuk starts out, as Habakkuk records for us what the Lord gives to him, is that the Lord gives a message. And I want us to see that because it sets the ground for everything that comes in the following chapters of the book of Habakkuk. And then it also, I think, is very relevant to us today in knowing that the Lord, and seeing how the Lord gives a message to Habakkuk, and in knowing that the Lord has given us a message today. So, when we come here to the first part, or the first verse of Habakkuk chapter 1, the oracle, or the pronouncement, that the prophet Habakkuk saw. Now, those two words are pretty familiar in the prophets of the Old Testament. The word oracle, or pronouncement, and also this idea of a vision. What's interesting here, though, with Habakkuk, is that normally you see the word oracle as a thing. It's a a noun. And normally you see the word vision as a noun also. But Habakkuk gives us this word in verb form. Therefore it's translated that instead of him having a vision, it is as if Habakkuk's telling us that he's actually seeing here this play out as God allows him to, in some ways it seems, come into his very presence. Right? You get the idea of Isaiah. Isaiah. in Isaiah chapter 6, when he gets to go before the throne of God, and he sees all that's going on there around the throne of God, and God addresses him directly and calls him to go and sends him to proclaim the message that the Lord has for his people during the days of Isaiah. Matter of fact, it would seem that Isaiah, probably about a hundred years before the time of Habakkuk, as we look back over history. Now that's debated in some ways, but that seems to be the best understanding of all that we have in Scripture. But this word oracle, it's an interesting word. It comes from, in the Hebrew, it comes from the word burden. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9, and the prophet Amos, in Amos chapter 3 verse 8, take this word and they use it, suggesting that once God gives a message, it becomes a burden on the prophet until the prophet announces that message or that word. And so it seems like Habakkuk is saying that the Lord came and he spoke and that this message that he gave to me was a burden in my heart and on my shoulders to take it to his people, to take it to those who would listen, right? A prophet was one who was called by God to proclaim the things that God had given him to tell to the people of his day. A prophet was called uh, to relay to the people People, what God was saying in most times was coming if the people, if God's people were not willing to hear and to repent, to turn from their wicked ways, to acknowledge Him, to seek forgiveness, and to return to a covenant faithfulness. And so uh, Habakkuk says that the Lord spoke and He gave me a burden that I must proclaim or a message to deliver to His people. And I want to stop right here just really quickly because what plays out now in the rest of Habakkuk is the vision. It's the oracle here. It's what Habakkuk is seeing and hearing from God. You know, one of the things about COVID is that every, well, not every church, a lot of churches have gone to some sort of an online format. So you have access to sermons just at the touch of your finger. 
Uh, I came across a, a Saturday night uh, church worship service. The church was down in Florida. It was not a Southern Baptist church. But I thought, I'm just going to listen to see what's, what's going on here. Matter of fact, not only is it not a Southern Baptist church, very charismatic church. Uh, and <laughs> the preacher, who I know, one of the preachers, they've got three, I guess. Well, that night, the a guy that I know was preaching for them. And so... He gets up and he says, the title of my message tonight is from evangelical to charismatic. From evangelical to charismatic. And I just took my earbuds out and I just started laughing and Carly said, what? And I said, I'm wondering if I should even waste my time listening from here on out. And anyways, he started off somewhat, according to the word, talking about two ditches that charismatics can fall into. Uh, seemed to be pretty accurate in his understanding of Scripture. And then he went from two ditches that charismatics need to avoid to hearing from the Lord. And his premises, it was interesting... In encouraging the congregation to hear a word from the Lord, he never said anything about opening their Bible and reading their Bible. And I thought, you want to talk to people, you're going to preach to people about hearing from the Lord, but then you are never once going to show them where the Lord has spoken. And he took it around to eventually saying that if you want to hear from the Lord, it has nothing to do with opening His Word. You just simply need to practice and put yourself around good godly Christians. And when thoughts pop into your mind... Write those thoughts down. Ask a good godly Christian if those thoughts sound like they came from God. And if a good godly Christian says those thoughts came from God, then it wasn't you thinking those thoughts. It was God giving you those thoughts. And I thought, how ridiculous. How unhelpful. I don't know about you, but I get to talk to a lot of people almost every day. Oftentimes it's a lot of the same people. Uh, I love our church family. But apart from talking to a lot of our church family each day, there is one voice that I hear more than any other throughout the day. And you know whose voice it is? It's Jaren's. There is constantly, in times of silence, I mean, maybe you're not the same way, maybe you're thinking I'm crazy at this point, there is a conversation that you begin having with yourself about all that's going on. And oftentimes it's conversations about what I'm reading in Scripture. It's conversations about choices to be had. It's conversations about, Lord, what is your direction and what is your will? But I have learned something very easily by a lot of failure. And that is that oftentimes the little thoughts that I have in my head are not thoughts that I need to understand as being the voice of God. As a matter of fact, what I need to understand as being the voice of God is found right here in His Word from Genesis to Revelation. And in light of all of this, we need to understand that when we talk about, we see the Lord giving a message to Habakkuk. Habakkuk doesn't come and give a vision that he came up with in his own mind. Habakkuk's not going to give us a conversation with God that he dreamed or imagined. Habakkuk's going to give us a conversation with God that God gave to him, that God inspired for him to write here and to record in his word, an inerrant, infallible word. And when we think about God speaking today, God speaks through and in accordance with His Word. And because the Lord has given us a message, namely His Word, the Bible, brothers and sisters, we need to hear that message, we need to be ready to take that message and proclaim that message. You know, the Word of God should be a burden in our heart to go and to share with the lost and dying world. You say, well, is that really going to make much of a difference? It has been interesting to see leading up to this election that took place all the way up until yesterday. How many people said the main focus for their vote was going to be on the economy? And then just how many people did not really vote with any concern about the economy? Because here's, here's the whole point. Uh, 
news outlets, newspapers, websites, media, pushing, pushing, pushing in the front. It's all about the economy. People care solely, uh, primarily about the economy. And then, ev and then everything else that you have read for the last six months in any major news source on pages 2 through 11 has been this revolution, namely this, namely this sexual revolution that has been going on across our land. It's not just a sexual revolution. You've still got all that's going on in regards to the debate about, around abortion and those matters. But what has been happening uh, over the last six months, especially in our country, has been, been centered so much around this sexual revolution. And you say, well, Pastor, homosexual marriage is not a new thing in this country. No. It, if we are still thinking that the conversation is centering around homosexual marriage, we're off by about ten years now. It's already past that. Not only is it already past the idea of homosexual marriage, the conversation is already, it seems, assuming in many places in our nation this idea of loving more than one and having more than one spouse. And then it's the biggest thing here lately has been the debate going on around transgenderism. And in the midst of a nation that is running so quickly into such disregard for the Lord and what He has said is good and right, running so quickly into sinfulness and immorality, running so quickly and wanting to do what everyone thinks is right in their own eyes, the only light that is going to outshine that darkness is Jesus Christ. And the light shines as the church holds to the message the Lord has given us. We talked last week in our final week that we did on our Bible study in politics about how Daniel held to biblical convictions in Daniel chapter 1 as he stood in the court of pagan king Nebuchadnezzar as a teenage young man. Sadly, there's not many teenage young men in the church in America today that would stand on those biblical convictions. One, because we've not discipled well in the church in America and two because we don't have many grown men that are able to hold on to biblical convictions right now in a day and age where the sinking sand is everywhere. But notice secondly the brokenness over the sinfulness of the land. So we saw that the Lord gives a message. Now we see brokenness over the sinfulness of the land. That's verses 2 through 4. How long, Lord, must I call for help? You do not listen or cry out to you about violence, and you do not save. Now that second phrase there in verse 2, talking about violence, is very similar to a verse in Job. Job chapter 19, verse 7 says, Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. You see... Uh, Habakkuk in this vision is praying to the Lord and he comes across as if he's been praying this way for quite some time. Lord, I'm calling to you for help. Lord, I'm calling to you. I'm letting you know about the sin that is so prevalent here in the land of your people. Lord, I'm telling you, I'm calling out to you about the violence that is so pervading here in our society and in this land that you've given us. I'm calling out to you, God, asking for you to save us. I'm calling out and yet you don't listen. I'm calling out and I've not seen you act to put an end to this godless violence that is going on here in the land of Judah. And we think about what kind of state that, this, that the land of Judah was in. If you go back to 2 Kings chapter 23, you read about the reforms that King Josiah had put in place. Now, Josiah, Josiah likely died um, right before, I would say, within a decade or so before Habakkuk wrote this letter. And what you read in 2 Kings is that the land was in great turmoil to begin with. They had turned their back on God, they had left the covenant, they had been disobedient, and they had sought and began worshiping many other gods and practicing many things that God had said 
were sinful and wrong. And so King Josiah finally, uh, he comes in and he gives these reforms. And the Bible tells us that the Lord, or that the nation, the land turned back to the Lord for a time. But right after King Josiah passed away, it became even more evil. But it, had, but it had been before the reforms of King Josiah. And so in light of that, you think about where this land must be, and I think that if we understand where it was before the reforms of King Josiah, and then the fact that it got even worse after King Josiah's time and his death, uh, it's not a pretty picture here on what's happening in the land of Judah with these people who are supposed to be the people of God. You think, you think about what kind of violence that the... Uh, the prophet must have been crying out to God about it. He continues in verse 3, Why do you force me to look at injustice? Habakkuk says, almost like he can't turn away. Or maybe the picture is more of this. Habakkuk says, There's nowhere that I can look in your land and not see wrongdoing, evil, and iniquity. You think about God forcing him to look at it. It's as if he can't look anywhere that there's not injustice going on. The depravity of the land. So in Habakkuk saying, I'm sick of seeing all this, he then asked the Lord, why are you sitting idly by? Why are you tolerating all this evil? Why are you tolerating all the sin amongst your people? Why do you observe and do nothing? I just really quickly say God is always up to something. I don't know what what's going to come of this election to be frankly or to be frank with you I'm not too worried about what's going to come of this election that's not me trying to be naive I understand that this is a huge crossroads for our nation I understand that there are two uh, completely different ideologies and philosophies that we had to pick from I understand that one of those was as completely un-American as you can imagine and it seems very likely that could be the the one who sits in the White House come um, 2021. But I also understand that Jesus was not up for election yesterday. yesterday. Nor will He ever be up for election. I understand That God is never sitting idly by, just observing. I understand that oftentimes it can feel like we pray and we cry and we ask the Lord for help. And wonder if He's even listening. I understand it can feel like oftentimes that we see so much going on that we know is wrong and that we know shouldn't be happening and we ask God to save the innocent. I understand that it's been a prayer in our nation, uh, in churches for years, that God would end the violence against the unborn. Nation, nation. Sometimes you feel like saying, God, why is it that we keep praying? Why is it that we keep bringing this before your eyes and you do not say And the text is, text is taking us to the fact that God's always up to something. It may not be what we expect. We may not understand it. Matter of fact, the Lord's going to tell Habakkuk, if I told you, you wouldn't even believe it. But he is clear that he is always up to something. Those words injustice and wrongdoing... We see the same concept in Isaiah chapter 59 verse 4. Now remember Isaiah wrote this about a hundred years before Habakkuk. But in Isaiah chapter 59 verse 4 the Bible says no one makes claims justly. Here's the first question. Why do you force me to look at injustice? No one pleads honestly. 
They trust in empty and worthless words. They conceive trouble and give birth to iniquity or wrongdoing. Listen to this. Habakkuk is perplexed. He is frustrated. I mean, you can't read this text and not see the emotion that Habakkuk's dealing with here. He is pushed to the limit on wondering what God's up to. And why there's so much violence and evil going on around him. Why God doesn't appear to be doing anything about it. Brothers and sisters, in the same way, listen to this. It seems that trouble and iniquity characterize our present cultural landscape and our society. One question we should ask ourselves is whether we have the same perspective on the sinfulness of human society as Habakkuk had. If Christians do not weep over the lostness of society, then there is no hope for society. Continues giving that list there of all that's happening that is continuing to grow and escalate. Then in verse 4, this is why the law is ineffective. What does he mean that the law is ineffective? I believe he's talking specifically about the law of Moses. He says that the people have disregarded what Moses has commanded is right. The people have disregarded the covenant and obeying what God you've told us is good. And because they have disregarded it, because they pay no attention to it, justice never emerges. For the wicked, look at this. Why is this happening? Because the wicked restrict the righteous. I don't know about you, but you think about what's been going on in our country since May. I know our law is not the law of Moses. But it seems that the law we do have in our land is being pushed in some places to being ineffective. Because the wicked trick the righteous. Notice that Habakkuk understands there's still a righteous remnant in the land. But what Habakkuk sees here is a whole lot more wicked people surrounding the righteous people. Therefore, even when justice is named, it comes out perverted. Ken Fentress said that we appeal to God for His intervention in our society because we want to see His glory honored above all else. And I think that's what's happening here with Habakkuk. He is appealing to God. He's appealing for God to intervene. He's appealing for God to come and to act on behalf of the righteous. And he's appealing to God to come and to act and to intervene in his society because he wants to see God honored. He wants to see God glorified above all else. He wants to see the people return to the Lord. And brothers and sisters, that should be our hearts as well. If you're listening in tonight, if you're here in person, it should be our heart as the church that we appeal to God for His intervention in our society because we want to see His glory honored above all else. Oftentimes we are so concerned about so many other things that we never even think about praying to God. For His glory and honor to be shown above all else. Church gets so busy in programs. And as Brother Field talked about Sunday morning, so consumed with wanting to build a mega church, that we forget we're not here for the glory of the church. We're not here for the size of the church. We're here for the glory of God. Notice thirdly, in verses 5-11, through last thing. The Lord works in astounding ways. I wanted to put that the Lord works in unbelievable ways. But the whole point is that we believe that the Lord can work in astounding ways. Because, again, the Lord says, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Habakkuk. But he also commands him three different ways in verse 5 to observe and to look and to be utterly astounded at what he's doing. 
that's how it plays out in verses 5 through 11. The Lord works in astounding ways. And so God gives a message. Habakkuk says, God, uh, God, what are you doing? Why are you doing nothing? God, why are you not acting on behalf of the righteous? Why do I not see you punishing sin? Why do I not see you correcting the iniquity and the injustice in our land? And then the Lord says, Habakkuk, I am working. Habakkuk, I am doing something. Habakkuk, you need to look and you need to observe and you need to be utterly astounded because I'm doing something right now. Look at this. He doesn't say, I'm going to do something. He says, I am doing something in your days. In other words, the Lord says, I am acting right now. I am not an idle God. I don't just sit back and observe and do nothing. I'm not a God who's incapable to act on behalf of my people. In your days, I am doing something that you will not believe when you hear about it. What is it that the Lord's doing? He's raising up a nation that's going to come in and overtake the people in the land of Judah in punishment and discipline for their rejection of the Lord, their unfaithfulness to His covenant, and their disobedience to Him. Catch that. The whole point of the Lord working in astounding ways is for you and I to notice this. It is for you and I to notice that the Lord's ways are not our ways. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Ken Fentress said, This speaks of the impossibility of assuming we always know how God will deal with the events that happen in this world. Catch that. The fact of the matter is, we have the Word of the Lord. And in some great ways, He's let us understand the, His ways, the ways of the Lord. But His ways are still higher than our ways. You and I call out to God thinking we know how He should act. You and I call out to God or cry out to God in prayer thinking we know what the right thing for Him to do would be. You and I call out to God thinking that we know that God has to do this or that. Matter of fact, I received a text yesterday morning uh, that said, if so and so wins... We'll know that the Lord is for our country four more years. If the other so-and-so wins, then we know that God has given up on us. I texted him back and I said, aren't you glad to know that God never gives up on His children? Now don't hear me wrong. America is not the nation of God's children. It never has been. There's only ever been one nation in history that was able to make that claim. That was the land of Israel. They lost. Their right to that claim, at least for now, Paul tells us that that's going to be restored in the future, but they lost that right to that claim when they rejected and denied Jesus Christ as His only Son. Brothers and sisters, the true church is not tied up and being dealt with as God deals with a sinful, unjust, unrepentant nation. Because we should not be like a sinful, unjust, unrepentant nation. There should be a difference. And by God's grace, there is a difference because we have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins have been paid for. And there is therefore now no condemnation. For those that are in Him. What we need to understand is that just when we think we have everything figured out about God's purpose, we come to learn that His ways are higher than ours. And I know that there have been a lot of preachers and teachers and even a lot of, a lot of false prophets. I'll just say it that way who have said that this, 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 and this is happening because this is what God is doing right now. 
And I would just like to tell them to read the book of Habakkuk. As God says to Habakkuk, one of his prophets, you're calling out to me saying I'm doing nothing, but I'm acting right now in your days, even what I'm doing. Unbelievable to you. I would tell him to see that whereas Habakkuk thought that if God was going to answer his prayers rightly, it would be that God would intervene personally in straightening out the sins of the nations. Instead, God says, discipline and punishment are coming. And they're going to come from a perverse, wicked, and unjust king and king. Catch that. God will use an unjust, sinful people to bring judgment on His sinful people. That's what's happening here in Habakkuk. That's what God explains to Habakkuk in verses 6-11. through 11. You see a metaphor and just let me quickly sum up the imagery for you. Over and over you see the, the imagery of the horses like leopards. You see them like a pack of wolves in the night. You see them as a people that's moving quickly as the wind goes through. The whole picture of what God is saying to Habakkuk is that I'm raising up a people and I'm raising up a king that will not be stopped when they come to execute judgment and discipline on you. As a matter of fact, they'll move through not only you, but other lands that stand before them so quickly that the people won't even know what happened. Well, how do you know they're an unrighteous people? He says it in the middle and he says it at the end, right? Real quickly, verse 7. They're fierce and terrifying. Their views of justice and sovereignty. Look at this key phrase here in verse 7. Stem from themselves. The Chaldeans are the Babylonians. They are Nebuchadnezzar and the forces that he's raising up. And if you'll remember, Nebuchadnezzar was known as one of the most prideful men in the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it was Nebuchadnezzar who God caused to lose his sanity because he was so prideful and arrogant. And after his sanity is restored, it is Nebuchadnezzar who cries out in Daniel chapter 4, verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and glorify the king of the heavens, because all his works are true and his ways are just. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. All of this stems from themselves because they are arrogant and boastful. They are a prideful people. And you see that played out at the end of verse 11. They are guilty. Notice this. It's God raising them up. And even in all that they do here, God's using them for a tool here to bring against His people in the land of Judah. And all that they do, God then pronounces the sentence upon them. The end of verse 11. They are guilty. Why? Because their strength is their God. Now, in Old Testament times, that is one of the strongest pronouncements of pride that you'll see. Old Testament times, countries relied on their gods. Little g, gods for victory. The Israelites relied on the one true God. Big G, God for victory in battle. That was their call. God said, I'll go before you. I'll go behind you. I'll surround you. I will give you victory. I will deliver the people into your hands. And when God promised that, that's exactly what He did in the Old Testament. The Philistines... The Amalekites, every people that, uh, every group of people that they came up against in the Old Testament that the Israelites faced in battle, they relied on their little g, false gods, to bring them victory. And now all of a sudden you come to Nebuchadnezzar and you come to this Neo-Babylonian empire and God says they're not even going to want to attribute their success to false gods like other people. They're going to attribute it to, them own, to their own selves. Even in the days of Jesus, with all the philosophers and Stoics in Greece, all the mythology that was taking place, the people still attributed so much to their pagan gods. And here to see Nebuchadnezzar in this Babylonian empire, the Chaldeans, claim their strength as their god is the absolute mark of pridefulness and arrogance. So what's so astounding... What's so surprising, 
What is so unbelievable is that the Lord's going to use a man and a people like that to come and to bring judgment amongst the people of Jesus. Say, Pastor, we didn't need any more bad news tonight. I'm going to end with some really good God still has the freedom and the liberty to act howsoever He pleases. And God will never act in a way that is wrong, unjust, or unbecoming because that's not His nature. Matter of fact, God showed us just what His nature was when He gave Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, to come and to die, sacrifice, place, sinful, prideful, violent men and women, so that all who would believe on Him might be made a new creation and receive eternal life. The good news tonight is that that same Jesus saved you and me and all who are in Him. The same Jesus who is King of kings and Lord of lords and will be for eternity. He is the same Jesus that is still mighty to save. Let's not, let's not forget about Christ, solid rock of our Father, thank you. I thank you for those who are here tonight. I thank you for those tuning in online and listening over the radio. God, I pray that you would help us to heed your word. Lord, that you would help church to be broken Broken to be broken over sin. Be broken for the sinfulness of society around us. May you help us to bring it to you as Habakkuk did in prayer. But Lord, may you help us pray over our land and over the lost. in a way that understands you that you are the God who acts and that you work in astounding ways and the most astounding thing you've ever did give your son Jesus Christ for sinners like me for sinners like us so that we might become the children of God children of righteousness and we go and proclaim this message We ask these things in His name. Amen.